Okay, is that better? No, no I'm not. Okay, well, I'm not, I wasn't talking to you. Okay. No, but um, obviously, uh, I've thrown this lesson in tonight because of some of the recent events uh, that have impacted an awful lot of us, and I realize maybe not everyone uh, here, but all of, the, all of us will be impacted at one point or another in our lives by grief and loss, and it's important for us to learn to think rightly um, and be able to trust God because of what we know, not necessarily just how we feel, but what we know. And that'll kind of be a little bit of a theme tonight. Uh, not that our feelings are illegitimate at all. God's given us feelings for a reason. They alert us to the fact that something needs to be done or dealt with. But we want to learn, uh, ultimately, to live according to what we know, not simply what we feel. So we're going to talk about tonight, trusting God through grief and loss. And a lot of you, probably a majority of you, um, yesterday at some point uh, heard the news, whether it was through a phone call or over social media or something, that a young man that attended this youth group some, I mean, not, not a lot because it wasn't home that much, but I remember Cora uh, coming and being a part of our group, and Caleb came a few times as well. He was kind of one of the younger ones at the time, and uh, that, that Caleb took his life. And, um, you know, that, I, I don't, I know that was jarring for me to here, it was, it was just one of those things just hard for me to imagine, especially the Caleb I knew was a fun-loving young kid that seemed to have the whole world ahead of him and full of talent and ability and enthusiasm and personality plus, and it's just hard for me to imagine, uh, though I hadn't seen him for a couple of years, that anything like that could have happened. And, and I saw many of you last night at a prayer service that uh, was held, um, really praying for Caleb's family particularly. But tonight's lesson is not simply about that scenario, although I definitely had that in mind as we put together the notes that we're going to look at today. But there are a lot of us been dealing with loss. Uh, Noah here just lost his mom. Uh, matter of fact, the very same day I heard about Caleb, I was attending the visitation for Noah's mom. And there, that's not unique either. Uh, there are a couple others of you I can think of right off the bat, maybe more than I'm not even aware of, but I think of Colin who lost his dad a few years ago. And, Gabe, who lost his dad just a few months ago, and uh, so there are several here that have had, to, and, and you may not even realize that, there are several right here that have dealt with tremendous loss. You know, I'm, I'll admit to you, when I, was a, when I was your age, the most significant loss that I experienced was the loss of my grandfather, and we were, we were pretty close, he just lived a couple blocks away from me, but but I think that pales in comparison to losing a parent or losing a friend or um, a child as my friend Randy did, Randy and Carrie did this week. So um, I think it's important for us to learn to think biblically. So I want you to kind of follow along with me now. We're going to be all over the place. This is not where we're going to open up one passage of Scripture, though there are some good places I'm going to point you to where you could go and kind of camp out for a little bit and spend some time drilling down deep, uh, considering um, you know, how God hears our pleas and our cries and some great places in Scripture to go to. I, that's one of the purposes. I hope you'll hang on to the notes that I've given you here tonight. But I want to talk kind of in broad terms to begin with, okay? As we think about grief and loss and death and separation and just a gut-wrenching um, time that, uh, that some of us are going through right now. And I, I think before we talk about some very practical how-tos in, in each of our, of our situations and circumstances, I want us to step back and just think of the, the big picture of what God has said about death and suffering and loss, okay? So there are three main things to keep in mind here. And I'm going to ask some folks to come and be my scripture readers uh, Romans uh, 5, 12. Would someone be willing to read that scripture? Valerie, make your way up here and be ready to go, okay? Would someone be willing to read 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57? Katie, go ahead and come on up to the front row so that you're ready to go. And then Revelation 21, 4. All right, Jacob, I'll let you come up here and you be ready to go as well, okay? And you three <coughs> get to it here shortly. So again, we're talking about, th th this is like, thinking not, not like in the immediacy of what's going on right today or right now in your life, but I just want to think about 
all of history and how God has, God has an overarching plan and history is all working towards something. So we need to understand this first and then we'll look at our little part to play in it, okay? So the first part of the big picture is death and sorrow are intrusions, intrusions into the world, brought into the world by sin. So, uh, Valerie, if you'd come on up and read Romans 5.12 for us, please. So notice, who is that one man, okay, that through which sin entered the world? What was his name? Adam. Adam. Through Adam's sin, Adam and Eve's sin, sin entered the world. Before that point in time, God had created the world in a perfect environment. You look at Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and you'll, chapter 1, you'll repeat this, you'll see this phrase over and over and over again. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was very good. And it wasn't until Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God that sin entered the world which brought death and sorrow and suffering. So death is not a part of God's original creation. Death and sorrow are these terrible intrusions into the world brought about by sin. And the second thing we need to understand is that death's power has been, I, I put in your notes, presently diminished and ultimately defeated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Katie's going to come. 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter is about the resurrection of Christ. But I'm not going to spring that on you, okay? I won't make you read the whole chapter. So I'm asking Katie to read kind of the exciting climax of the chapter, where after Paul just talks about how important the resurrection is, Jesus come back from the dead. He's demonstrated he is the Son of God. He has power over sin and death. And now here are these last few verses. All right, because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, because of God demonstrating his mighty power and resurrecting Jesus from the dead, we now have hope for our future resurrection as well, that death is a defeated enemy. It's an enemy. It's an intrusion. It's something we hate. We despise it. It's okay to hate death. It's okay to, to mourn the loss of a loved one. That's, that's, that's only natural and logical to do so. But understand this. The power of death is not the same as it was before the resurrection of Christ. It has been diminished and ultimately defeated because of what Jesus did for us on the cross and through the resurrection. And then finally, the best news of all. Jacob, come on up. Death, death's removal will be complete one day in heaven. And go ahead and read for us. Stand in front of the mic there if you would, Jacob. Revelation 21.4. How awesome does that sound? Are we looking forward to a day someday when death is no more, when he will wipe away every tear, every grief will be cared for. Uh, one day, death's removal will be complete and perfect in heaven. So we need to understand that, that picture, okay, that, that what we are experiencing right now is that in-between time between God creating everything perfect and the time when once again everything will once again be made right and sin will be defeated and death will no longer be with us. But right now we live in this in-between time period where death is an intrusion still, but it is diminished because of what Christ has done on the cross. So that's the big picture. But right now we're dealing with, right now we're dealing with the here and now. And right now we struggle with the realities of not even just death. I mean, you could put any other type of harm or trial that you might go through. Death's kind of the big one. 
but there are a lot of other issues that we're dealing with. Some of you here might be dealing with discouragement uh, over other issues. And so there'll be application to be made here. But we're talking mainly about grief and loss as a result of death here tonight. Um, I want to stop for a minute and say that if you uh, are looking for counsel from the world, from uh, you know, secular authorities, you know, from like a school guidance counselor or, uh, you know, Dr. Phil out there or uh, some counselor you might see on the Internet or Facebook or Instagram. Um, here's some of the wisdom that you might receive. And I'm not bad mouthing it at all. I'm just saying this is what is available out there. You'll have some people tell you, you know, it's it's rough what you're experiencing right now, but ultimately time heals all wounds over time. Things will subside and will gradually get better. Or if you've, uh, if you've done much study at all in the realm of psychology, you'll, um, authorities will tell you that there are essentially five stages of grief that we go through. It's denial at first, even you act in shock, you don't really believe what's even happening. You get angry about it, maybe with the person who's died or with God or with someone uh, else close to the situation, even yourself perhaps. You bargain, uh, you may bargain with God, you may bargain uh, with yourself or just go through a whole bunch of what ifs, what if this would have happened, this could have been better. Depression, you know, despair as a result, uh, kind of immobilized and refusing to do a whole lot and just um, being mired in sorrow and grief and then ultimately acceptance. Um, that would, that's generally how the world describes the stages of grief. Um, you will be told that there's no right way or wrong way to grieve. Uh, everyone grieves differently. Some of us are more emotive than others. Uh, you know, some of us, you know, cry when we watch a Disney movie, okay? And, okay, thank you. And, and you know, and some of us, you know, it's going to take an awful lot to make me, I'm not going to cry unless someone, you know, hit my thumb really hard with that hammer. Then maybe I'll cry, but only momentarily. Um, there's, so there's no right or wrong way uh, to grieve, to go through our grief. Some people want to be alone. Some people want to be in a group. Uh, there, there's no right or wrong way uh, to grieve. And ultimately, grief is simply a process of accepting a new normal in your life, whatever it is that you've lost, whether it's a person, a relationship, or something else, a job, whatever it might be. Grief is simply a process of accepting a new normal. Now, I want to say that there is a lot of truth in those statements there. I am not here to badmouth those things. I think some of that is good counsel to hear. Uh, we need to be careful. I don't think that grief is necessarily a rigid five stages, but I don't think most secular co uh, counselors would say that. Uh, they're just kind of speaking in broad terms. These are some of, all they're trying to do is just explain the feelings, the emotions that we naturally feel when we've suffered a loss. And so, again, I'm not here to say, that's bad. I wouldn't say that at all. Uh, there's some value to what is, uh, they're just observing nature and observing mankind and, and what happens. Um, some things I'll, I would, I know, I'm not sure that time heals all wounds, but I, I understand the idea. Things do tend to get better over time because you gain perspective. But what I want us to understand, though, is that God offers us far more than simply that advice. I mean, that's, there's some good advice there, some good things to know and understand. I wouldn't have put them in your notes if they weren't, but, but that alone I find to be woefully insufficient in really helping me deal with the tremendous grief and loss that we sometimes experience in life. As a pastor, I've had many opportunities to walk with families through times of tremendous loss. I can remember a farmer who... After a long day of harvest, just sat down on the side of his tractor, uh, trailer actually where they'd been uh, bringing in crops, and he just kind of leaned over, died of an aneurysm. Guys, this is from the best of health, brain, you know, blood clot went to the brain. I think, I, any, I forget what an aneurysm really is, but I remember it was a brain aneurysm. I mean, it just popped and he was gone. I, I've, I've been with folks who've walked with people through cancer and, you know, long term, just long, drawn out, difficult. Uh, process of dying, or some with dementia, which I think is the worst possible way to die, uh, just as a relative just forgets who you are and even who they are, and a uh, good friend of mine walked through that, well, probably one of my best friends here at church walked through that a few years ago, and that's 
just gut-wrenching. And what I want to say to you is, uh, as helpful as some of the world's advice is, I don't believe it's adequate, and I believe God offers us far more than that. However, the big issue that I think particularly yesterday that caught so many of us off guard wasn't just the loss of someone that many of us knew and loved, but the way that loss came about. Suicide. Someone in such despair that at 15 years of age thought life wasn't going to get better. Took his own life. That is a hard one to swallow. It really is. And uh, so I want to talk about suicide for a few moments here. I'm going to watch the clock and try to not do it more than 10 minutes because it's not the only thing I want to talk about tonight. But I want us to talk about suicide for just a moment. First of all, suicide is in the Bible. There are several instances in the scriptures of individuals who took their own life. And I went ahead and listed them for you. I've I've never actually done a study like this, so I kind of went through the Old Testament here. And there are several individuals who, uh, in one way or another, took their life. Probably the most famous ones would be Samson. But Samson isn't quite the same because Samson did die at his own hand, but he did so in bringing about victory over his enemies. And so a whole bunch of people died when he died, and so it was almost more of a war type scenario than it would than we would consider a suicide. Saul um, uh, despaired to be killed by his enemies and so basically uh, uh, attempted suicide. His armor had his armor bearer help him and then his armor bearer attempted and did commit suicide. And perhaps the most famous one, Judas, who after betraying the Savior went out and hung himself. But there are others in the Bible. Well, well, those are one, two, three, four, if you count Saul and his armor bearer. Those are seven individuals in the Bible that did kill themselves. Um, I also thought of, I could think of five, particularly, that, uh, that did not kill themselves, but the Bible tells us they were severely depressed and discouraged. Um, they were depressed to a great extent. Elijah here. Let's take your Bibles real quick, and uh, rather than people come up, uh, I'll, I'll do the reading real fast here for us, but, but I would like you to take your Bibles and look at these with me, if you would, please. So in the Old Testament, book of 1 Kings here, many of you are familiar with the prophet Elijah, one of the greatest prophets in all the Bible, by the way, no slouch. Uh, we're told when, when, when uh, John the Baptist came, he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Uh, so, I mean, Elijah was a revered prophet of God. And after Elijah has had a tremendous victory over the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings, he is being chased and hounded now still by Jezebel, who wasn't present at that big victory. And so as he has literally kind of found himself running for his life and hiding out from the king in 1 Kings chapter 19, here's what we read. Um, I'll run back, I'll walk back to verse 3. 1 Kings 19 verse 3. When he saw that he rose, he ran for his life. He went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servants there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed. Listen listen to this. He prayed that he might die. And he said, it's enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. I mean, my circumstances are no better than anybody else's. This is just too much to bear. And as we consider Elijah, one of the reasons that he despaired of his life is because he felt all alone. I'll just, I'm just going to scan in my Bible here, but if you look all down in verse, verse 10, it says, so, so he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. He felt all alone. Look down at verse 14, it's the, at the end of that verse, the last, verse, last sentence of verse 14, I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. He, he feels like he is all alone. And yet in verse 18 we read this. This is the angel from, that God has sent, speaks to Elijah, and he says, 
Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal. So as we think about Elijah, God, what did God do when Elijah was discouraged and depressed and ready to end his life? Just as soon have it be over. God sent an angel to minister to him, just a messenger. The word angel just means messenger, okay? So the fact that it's an angelic being, that's cool. But God basically just sent someone to minister to him. He didn't want Elijah to be all alone. So he sent an angel to him. And that angel reminded Elijah that he was not alone. He is not the only person who is facing um, Jezebel and all, and all of her minions at this time. He is not the only one faithful to God. There are hundreds, 7,000 in fact, in Israel. So God sends an angel, sends a messenger to him and reminds him he's not alone. You might think about that. If you're ever feeling discouraged and depressed, that you are not alone. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There's no temptation taking you except such as is common to man. Such as is common to man. In other words, you're not alone. You're not the first one to ever experience this pain. You're not the first one to ever experience this grief, this loss. You're not the first one to experience heartache. You're not the first one to think, Oh, I despair of my life. No, many have gone before and many today stand with you and are trusting God in the midst of it. All right, another person in the Bible. And here we're not given a, a specific scenario so much. I just want to read a single verse out of Ecclesiastes. So if you'll take your Bible and turn there, this is kind of like a sword drill almost, isn't it? Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. If you'll turn there, Ecclesiastes chapter, and I could have picked a couple of verses here. But Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 17 says this. Oh, I'm in Song of Solomon. Maybe somebody turn the fan off because it's blowing my pages here. Um, here's what he says in Ecclesiastes 2.17. He says, Therefore I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me for all his vanity and grasping at the wind. Notice he says he hated his life. Now, if you've ever read Ecclesiastes, it's not the, most, it's not the best pick-me-up uh, portion of the Bible. Okay, a lot of it is somewhat depressing. It basically says you can do all you want, but you're still going to get old and fat and die, basically. They didn't say fat. I threw that, I threw that in. Um, but it basically says, you know, the world just continues on as it is. And once you're gone, there'll be no, ultimately, there'll, ultimately there'll be no remembrance of you. Life just continues on. And uh, que sera, sera. That's, that's not a real encouraging book. And a lot of this are the ramblings of Solomon in his life. And at this point in his life, he's kind of gotten away from God. And he isn't so much focused on God. But by the time we get to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon comes back around and he says, you know what, let's, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Those last couple of verses of Ecclesiastes there in chapter 14. So let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, revere God, keep his commandments. This is my all. This is life's all. This is what I'm called to do. So for Solomon, he remembered that the purpose of life is tied to one's relationship with God. We find meaning and significance in life not in the things that we accumulate, or in the stuff that we do, but in our relationship with God. If you focus on the stuff you do and the things you accumulate, hear me in this, you can be just as, end up just as depressed as Solomon. But if you come around and remind yourself, oh, no, life is about far more than that. Ultimately, my joy, my happiness, my purpose is tied to my relationship with God. I, I won't even... I won't even read the ones in Jonah. There's twice in uh, Jonah chapter 4 where we say, we, we see that Jonah says he wishes he were dead. Life is just too awful because God has been merciful to the people of Nineveh. Okay, we have to just step back and admit here, Jonah's not just got a bad perspective, he's got a rotten attitude. And so God addresses that though. So <clears throat> God challenged his thinking. God came to Jonah both times, twice there in chapter 4. You can look it up later on your own. We just don't have time to look up every one of these. When God confronts Jonah, he says, Jonah, you're not thinking right. Don't you realize that, don't you realize that plant you're upset about is not worth nearly as much as all the souls of these people that are out there, the lives of these people? Uh, and so he confronts his wrong-headed thinking. God challenged his thinking and addressed his wrong attitude. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 1.8, 
It says that he despaired even of his life. Let's look at that one. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, because that's probably not as nearly as familiar to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You probably may, might have been shocked even to see that in your notes there, that Paul, Paul had despair. Paul was depressed. I mean, I thought Paul was this superhuman missionary that accomplished so many great things for God, and he did. But, but listen to 2 Corinthians 1.8. He says, for we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of all our, our trouble, which has come to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. This is not some immature Christian. This is not some person that doesn't know God. This is not some teenager or junior high kid whose emotions may be up or down. No, no, no. This is a servant of God who's accomplished great things for God. He says, it was bad. And we despaired even of our life. What, what do we do in that situation? What do we do in that circle? Well, look at what happens. Look at just the next few verses. Yes, he says, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. We thought we were going to die. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Oh, this is awesome. Who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust so that we shall still deliver us. You also are helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the, for the gift granted to us through many. Notice here, he, he put his trust in God and relied on the prayers of others. So Paul comes along and you know, he says, I, you know, I felt like this might be the end, and I'm ready to die, and this, I would despair. We would rather have died. He says that actually again in Philippians chapter 1. He says, I'm thinking about, you know, it'd almost be better for me just to die, depart and be with Christ, would be far better. But then he comes back to his, around in Philippians 1 and says, but you know what, I know to continue on is far more needful for you, and I will continue on. So he despaired. So what did he do when he despaired? He put his trust in God, and he relied on the prayer. Notice he says there, you also helping together in prayer for us. Paul says, as you prayed for me, you helped me get through that time of despair, that time of anguish. And boy, you probably haven't thought of this one, have you? Jesus. Jesus. The Bible tells us that when Jesus agonized in the garden, in the gospel of Matthew, that Jesus' soul was so vexed. If, we, if you look at the words that are used here, it's, it's, it's interesting to see the language that Matthew records here for Jesus. In Matthew 26, he says, I'll be a little here too. What, what verses are Matthew 26? No, it's 27. There you go. 27 verses 3 through 5. Okay. Uh, oh, no, excuse me. Where's Matthew? 26, 36. All right. He took, it says he took... Uh, he took Peter, took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, it'd be James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, here's the word, this is the words of Jesus. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Oh Father, if it's I won't read the whole prayer. But Jesus says there that he, his own words was that he despaired. He was exceedingly sorrowful even to death. So what did Jesus do? Well, he prayed, and he asked his friends to pray with him. He prayed, he communed with the Father, and he asked his friend. Remember, he took Peter, James, and John with him to pray. Okay, I mean, this, you talk about the ultimate example. This, he is superhuman. He's, he's, he is the perfect man and the son of God, God in the flesh. And yet what an example he gives us. He despairs. What does he do? He does the very same thing you and I can do. He prayed, and he got some other guys with him and asked them to pray for him as well. Pray with and for him. This is some, these are some pretty good examples of individuals in God's word that dealt with depression and rather than act on these feelings of depression and take one's own life even though they may have said they despaired of death they trusted God enough and found a way to make it through um, quickly here about suicide you know just just briefly 
Suicide is obviously murder of oneself. So that's probably self-evident here to everybody if you think about what suicide is. I mean, the word suicide doesn't show up in Scripture, but the Bible tells us thou shalt not murder. So it's a sin with terrible consequences, and it's, and it's never God's will for an individual to commit suicide. God's the creator of life. He's the giver of life. He alone determines its length. But I do want to address this, because I was brought up believing this, that if someone who commits suicide because their last act on this earth was a sin goes to hell. I don't know if you've heard that before, but I was taught that as a kid. That was kind of a prevalent, I don't know if that's as prevalent today, but I think it's out there. But if you'll step back for a moment and think about that, that can't really be right. Because ultimately it's our faith and trust in Christ that opens up the doors to heaven, right? It's, it's, but it's belief in Christ that, that changes our circumstances and leads to heaven. It's, it's, not, it's not the things that we do. I mean, we ought to live a life of obedience, and we ought not to break God's commands as best we can, but we, none, of us, none of us perfectly obey God's commands. It's very likely that your last act on earth might be a sin of one kind or another. But I remember in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will one day have eternal life. Is that what it says? It says they have eternal life. The Bible tells us when we trust Christ as our Savior, and we can, by the way, 1 John 5, 13 says, I've written these things to you that you might know that you have eternal life. You don't have to wonder, will I have eternal life or not? Philippians 1, 6, Paul says, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. Jesus is the one who sees us through, not our own works, not the actions that we take. Romans 8 says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing, not even your sinful action. I know there are some that do believe you can lose your salvation, but even the friends I have that do believe you can lose your salvation, which I don't believe, but even the ones I do know that believe that, most of them would say it's not a single sin that would do that. It's apostasy. It's renouncing your faith in Christ. It's denying Jesus as your Savior. And that's not what... Suicide is a terribly poor choice. And I know there's a reason why preachers don't address this very often. There's a reason I am very careful tonight to even talk about this. Because a lot of people think that once you say what I've just said, that suicide does not send a person to hell, that that's like a green light now for people to start taking their life. Well, of course not. Of course not. It's not God's will. And I would think for all of us and most of us in this room right now that are still reeling from the situation with our missionaries in South Africa, we, we, we've been reminded the last 24 hours of just what terrible destruction and consequence and heartache and sorrow comes from someone who would take their own life. Um, feelings versus knowledge is so important. We need to learn just as these great men in the Bible did, Elijah and Solomon and Paul and Jesus. I don't know about Jonah. I'm not sure what happened to him, but these others learned to live their life based on what they knew to be true. What you learn, And I want you to learn to live your life based on what you know rather than simply how you feel. All right, if you'll flip your page over your notes, and if anyone's watching on YouTube, I'll be more than happy to send you the notes. But uh, the back side of your page, okay, don't worry, don't fret. We're not going to read all those verses. We couldn't do that tonight. Not going to happen. I knew I wasn't going to get it all in. But I wanted to give you a place to go, because I know right now there's probably several here that are discouraged and downright depressed about this whole situation right now. And, uh, or, and there's other issues going on. Again, even for those of you that don't know the teach out that you might be wrestling with. And so I've just given you a smattering of scriptures there that I think are a good place to start. Get into God's word. And some, a lot of the psalms that I put in there are psalms of lament, where whether it's David or some other psalmist are just crying out to God and asking for God's help and intervention, and sometimes those psalms are great to read and also great to just to turn into prayers to our Lord, prayers of anguish even to God. And I'd encourage you to, to feel like you can bring your concerns, your grief, your feelings, your hurt, even your anger and dismay to God and express them, and that's what we see. I mean, a lot of the psalms are, you know, 
peppy songs, encouraging psalms about you know, great things that God has done for us, but there's quite a few psalms that when David was having a tough day and almost died, or when um, any of the other psalmists that, that wrote just were struggling with why good things seem to happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people and why turmoil and heartache hit believers and in Yahweh God. Some of those psalms might be a good place to start to dig into. We're gonna, I'm gonna gloss over them for now, though. That's uh, so. Those, but there's just a number of scriptures for those who grieve. I just don't think we have time to make our way through. I want to. Here's what I do want to hit on: how God can use heartache and pain. Some of this, I'll admit, is a little biographical. I'm telling you how I have seen in my own life God use heartache and pain, either in myself or in those that I've ministered to. Um, although I think all of the principles here are definitely scriptural. You'll see a lot of scriptural principles here. Um, First of all, though grief is a sober reminder of the reality of death and ultimately of who our enemy is. This is probably as quiet as it's ever been for a youth lesson here, especially with 60 of you here in this room, but um, there's a reason for that, because this is a sobering time. We have been reminded of the finality of death. We have been reminded this week on more than one occasion that death is this terrible interrupter. And in our world today, you know, we live in a first world country. You know, we live on a good old U.S. of A. And I'm proud to be an American where I won't die till I'm 80. Okay, the song doesn't say that, but that's kind of how we feel oftentimes, right? We live in a prosperous country where best medical care money can buy. And, and uh, you know, we don't think about death intruding into our life, particularly when we're young like this. But... When we go through heartache and pain like this, there is a a side of this that is necessary and sobering for us to remember the severity of death and the nature of death. And I I just want to share a couple verses from John's Gospel where we're reminded who our ultimate enemy is that we are still wrestling with to this day. Two places in John's Gospel. uh, First of all, in John chapter Eight, where Jesus is going back and forth with uh, some of the religious leaders here. It's going to get really heated uh, between the two. I'm not going to read the whole context, but you're welcome to check it out. But in John 8, 30, 44, he says, speaking to these religious leaders, he says, You are of your father, the devil. Talk about coming to words. I mean, that's pretty stern. And the desires of your father you want to do. And here, just now it's going to describe... Now Jesus, this is Jesus going to describe the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources because he is a liar and the father of it. Satan is a liar. He is a thief. He is a murderer. And for an individual, you know, I don't know all the situations with Caleb. I wouldn't begin to speculate. It would be inappropriate for me to do that. But I will tell you this. Oftentimes when God comes along and is trying to protect someone and has called them to himself, Satan will also come along and he'll sow these, he'll whisper these lies one way or another to us. Oh, you're not good enough. Life's never going to get better. This is all there is. No one loves you. You're all by yourself. Those are lies from Satan. He is the father of lies, and ultimately he is out to murder you. And essentially, suicide is the end result oftentimes. Of, I'm not saying always, but the end result of that. We're told in John chapter 10 that Jesus is the good shepherd. He is the door of the sheepfold. He's also the good shepherd. But he says, there are thieves out there who will break in. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Satan is a destroyer. And while he may not be able to 
snatch away our salvation. He can take away our testimony and even our life if we'll listen to him and heed him. So this heartache that we're experiencing right now, this grief that we're processing right now, this pain, this real pain that we feel is a reminder that there's a spiritual battle that we're in. This is real. This is serious stuff. It's, you know, life is not simply about making a bunch of money and having a nice house and playing video games and without leisure time, okay? This is, there's a spiritual war going, in, going on. Peter tells us that Satan walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Let this heartache, this terrible time that we're experiencing right now, remind you of that, that we are in a battle, a cosmic battle against good and evil. God wins. Jesus already won the victory. But make no mistake about it, death is still very real. Um, second thing that I think of good that or benefit that can come out of or what God can do in the midst of our heartache and pain is that this heartache and pain reminds us of what is most important. It has a way of putting everything in perspective, of reminding us of what is the most important thing in life. I don't know about you. But I bet once you heard about what happened over there in South Africa the other day, you could care less whether the Colts won last weekend or not. Who cares? A sobering time like this has a way of reminding us what's most important. It's the things that we obsess over. I heard uh, Katie's mom yesterday at that prayer service talking about, you know, all these homeschool moms, they could care less about biology today. Care far more about what's going on in the hearts and minds of their children. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't ever study biology. Okay, your mom's going to be mad at me if I say that. Though I've never used it, I'll just say that. But I'm stopping, okay? It reminds us of what's most important in life. What's most important? Well, you know, I just thought of, off the top of my head, I put it on Life matters. Your life matters. Life you only get to live this life on this earth once. You only get to have this day one time. Make it matter for Christ. Relationships matter. People matter. Not, 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 not the stuff of life, not how much money's in your wallet or you know, how, how much fame you might eat. No, the relationships that you have with one another and with God. That's what matters. Eternity matters. And what we do today in this life does make a difference for eternity. And so this is a time to remind ourselves of what really is most important, peace with God, the salvation of sinners. That's what matters most. Thirdly, I think we see from pain and heartache that we're experiencing even right now that God reminds us of our weaknesses and, and our need to fully rely upon him. And in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 12 there, Paul isn't so much talking about death, he's talking about that thorn in the flesh, this difficulty he was experiencing. But it was grief, it led to a lot of grief and heartache in his life. And he said, what it reminds him of is that when he is weak, that's when he's strong. That's when God shows up in his life and enables him to be strong in the Lord. And so when we are down and our hearts are breaking and we feel like there's nothing we can do, it's a reminder that, well, yes, we can't do much. We are weak, but he is strong. But he is strong. It reminds us that we've got to fully rely upon God, that ultimately we are dependent people upon God. Um, and you probably, anyone has heard me teach very long at all on, from the scriptures about uh, life in general. You probably expected me to get to this one eventually, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, and that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose for those he foreknew, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You see, the Bible tells us that all of life, the purpose of this life, and life does matter, and the purpose of this life is for God to conform us, to make us more like Jesus Christ, to shape us into Jesus and Paul uses those exact words in Galatians chapter 4 when he says, I am praying and I am laboring for you until Christ is formed in you. Paul's earnest desire for those people he was ministering to 
It wasn't for them, for them to be wealthy and happy and pretty and safe. No, his concern was that Christ would be formed in them. That they would be in Christ and Christ would be in them and that ultimately they'd be made to be more like Christ. And we go through the, the great promise that Romans 8.28 is for you and I that know Jesus as our Savior is that the stuff that we experience, even this heartache right now that we experience, God doesn't waste anything. God doesn't waste any of these events. He works it all together for our good and ultimately for his glory. Isn't that awesome? That God uses even the junk, the awful, even the bad stuff of life. Now, by the way, that's not a promise for everybody. Okay, This is not one of those kind of things that just let go, let God, and God takes care of it. No, the Bible says it's for those who are the called according to his purpose, for those who are in Christ. And not necessarily true. That's not a promise made to everyone in the world. But for those of us that know Jesus, that's the promise. That he is shaping us into Christ as we go through these trials and struggles. Um, here's uh, where I want us to camp out and end, really. And then we're going to have some time for you to go into your prayer groups and Hopefully has some a little bit of discussion, but I just really appreciate you spending more time in prayer than discussing tonight. I think it'd be good. Um, God has really given us three gifts, three means to help us deal with heartache and pain. The first one is the Word of God. That's why I gave you that big list of scriptures up there. But my goodness, that is by no means an exhaustive list. Just stay faithful in your quiet times and. God will speak to you through his word. The word of God is a gift of God. Your word is a, what to my feet? Lamp to my feet and a light to my path. By the way, the verses are over there on the organ if you need extra verses. There's no new verse tonight. Still have the same three verses. Yeah, God's word lights our path. God, God's word directs us. God's word helps us deal with the emotional issues of life, with the discouragement and despair that, Life sometimes doles out at us. And so in your notes, I put an action step there. You need to force yourself to daily be in the Bible. Listen, some of you are probably pretty doggone depressed. And maybe yesterday was a, was a very, I'm sure it was a very rough day. And you want to just kind of just close off the world and just spend the rest of the day in bed and just, just kind of wallow in your depression some, in days like that, you have to force yourself to do what you know to do is right. Okay, you don't, you don't feel like getting up and reading your Bible and doing your quiet time on days like that. I know that. I'm, guys, I'm there too. I'm with you. But you do it anyway because you know this is what God has given us to change our thinking, to help pull us up out of this. God is given, it's a gift of God. He's given us his word. Second thing there that uh, God has given us, he's given us his spirit. For those who are saved, we have the spirit of God dwelling in us. You know, I think it was only maybe an hour or two after Randy first posted the update from South Africa that hit the, hit face, the Facebook world anyway, the social media world. And I saw that, um, uh, where's Annalise? Annalise's, Annalise's mom, uh, I'd be Ben's mom too, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> but she instantly had put up on, on, uh, on, on Facebook there, underneath that post, a quote from um, Romans chapter 8, talking about how the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that can't even be uttered. You know, we, we just don't even know how to pray. We don't even know what to say. We're just dumbfounded at moments like that. But thank God we have the Spirit of God in us. And, and so... Because we have the Spirit of God in us, because we have access to God through the Holy Spirit, we can put our thoughts and our feelings together in prayer to God, and we can pour them out to the Lord. Um, God can handle whatever you have in your heart and in your mind right now. You might say, well, but I'm actually kind of mad at God right now. That's one of the emotions that I'm dealing with right now because I know God's sovereign. God could have stopped this and didn't. And I'm kind of mad at God over this. You can tell him that too. You read some of those Psalms, you'll find out David did much the same. Now we recognize even as we say that it's a little foolish to think that way ultimately. And we know that here, but we don't feel it here. 
God knows what you're feeling already. You're not going to shock him, I promise. He already knows what's going on in your heart and in your mind. Just pour it out to him. Express it to him in prayer. Let the Spirit of God guide you as you do so. And then lastly, forgive. So these are gifts that God gives us to help process and deal with heartache and pain. The Word of God, the, the Spirit of God, and then the people of God. <laughs> the people of God. The body of Christ. The church. Your friends that know Jesus as their Savior, you might be sitting right next to them in the seat right now. And, and so when we're processing the heartache and pain that we have, we, we need to talk about it. We need to share that. You need to share what share it with your parents. Well, I guarantee you, your parents are going to be more than happy to sit down and talk to you about the heartache that you're experiencing right now. They want to share that with you and walk with you through that. Good peers, godly mentors, Sunday school teacher, a pastor at your church, a youth leader. Well, let them let them know what you're thinking and what's what's going on in your heart. Now, that's not to the exclusion of the first two. Okay, all three of these are gifts of God. All three of these are important ways they help us process our our pain and our heartache. The Word of God, the Spirit of God who will guide us in our prayers, and the people of God. The God. Paul talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that the, bo- that, that the church is like a body. And so if the right hand hurts, the whole rest of the body hurts. If something's going on with the eye, it impacts the rest of the body. The feet, foot can't say, oh, because I'm not part of the, I'm not part of the arm, I'm going to just be detached and not be part of the body. We are all joined and knit together. And when one of us hurts, we all hurt. So deal with the people of God. Spend time with God's people. That's not to say there isn't a time to be alone with God and to pray. There is. Use all three of these gifts God has given us to deal with this heartache and pain that we experience. Leaders, there are three discussion questions. Uh, I'll leave it to your discretion, uh, leaders, how much time you spend on each one. I appreciate you spending even the bulk of your time, though, praying for the concerns that you all have. Um, I think tonight we've got uh, one leader that's not here. So I'm going to pray, and uh, we'll shut off the video after I pray, and then we'll uh, have groups dismissed here. Just, just stay in your seat for a second after we pray, okay? Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. There's so much there that can guide us and help us to think rightly as even as we deal with a lot of feelings, Lord, right now that are just so raw and so deep. God, thank you for your spirit that indwells us. And, and Lord, I guess maybe we just want to pause in the midst of this prayer and say, God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, who's, who's walking through this turbulent time, this turbulent world on their own, Father, that they don't have these same resources and they don't have these same promises, I pray God, that maybe tonight they would seek someone out and they would come to know for sure that they know Jesus as their Savior. But thank you, God, for your spirit. Thank you, God, for your people. Thank you, God, for the brothers and sisters in Christ that I have right here in this room. Thank you, God, that we don't walk alone. Just like Elijah felt like he was alone and there were thousands, thank you, God, that we don't have to walk through this life alone either. We love you, God. Thank you for the gifts you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.